I'm a uh, occasional lecturer at UCD in sociology, and um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this. It's an uh, incredible event for a World Vegan uh, Day, and I'm assuming, hang on a minute, let's see if we can get rid of that. I'm assuming it's going to go on uh, from year to year and strength to strength. Probably going to uh, need a bigger place like the RDS, I think. Okay. Yeah. Right, so that question, just going back to that. Uh, that question we're going to try and just lift the lid on it really, kind of how do we grow up as uh, animal loving animal users? And so um, this is really a snippet from my research work, a really kind of small fraction. So if you want to have a look at that in more general terms, then that's the address to look at, in particular that chapter, the Species Barrier Maintenance. If you can't be bothered writing that down, if you just Google Roger Yates Social Construction, you will usually get it. Okay. Now some of the uh, slides are kind of fairly full, but we're just going to pick, be picking out certain parts of it. If you want afterwards to actually see the PowerPoint in its total glory, as it were, then please email me roger.yates at ucd.ie, and I'll be happy, in fact, ecstatic, to uh, send it to you. Okay, so the talk is based on a core sociological idea, which is socialization. And um, as you see here, it can get quite complicated. There are lots and lots of agents of socialization. We're going to mainly talk in this kind of area about family socialization. And that really means, in terms of the two types that we focus on, that means primary socialization rather than secondary socialization. That's, that's the, the kind of thing we're going to focus on. Sociologists make big claims about sociology. For example, if you look here, we're talking really about how people become members of society, how we get inducted into the world. But that also means there's an element of social control about it. You know, even the notion of social conformity. And it is true, sociologically, most people are conformists. Even people who self-identify as radical, you know, underneath, as it were, there's lots of conformity in, in terms of their views and behaviour in particular. And then down, down there is a kind of classic sociological thing of uh, all these socialising agents kind of pouring their norms and values and ideas and opinions into the child. And finally on this, this is to kind of highlight the fact that um, it's regarded that uh, if children are not socialised, they're a problem. They're not going to fit into society. So they need to be socialised. And in terms of socialising agent, in a conventional um, society or conventional family, then usually a lot of it initially falls to the mother in primary socialisation. We're talking about very basic skills here. You know, how to use knives and forks and uh, go to the toilet, this kind of thing. You know, human beings are helpless when they're born, but we learn uh, very quickly. What essentially then the job is, is to um, inculcate the norms and values of society, and we're really kind of cueing people in to the culture of society. Now, normally when I've got a bit of time to do this kind of talk, I will give out a pencil and paper, and I will ask people, will they please draw me a farm? And it probably won't surprise you to find that this is the kind of thing that most people draw for me. Uh, it's not quite as good as that, but you, you get a line drawing of that kind of thing. So essentially, this is the kind of classic thing. The only people who don't draw this type of farm are animal advocates. Because if you like, they can know the truth if, if you want. So there are some themes to this. Uh, in particular, it's a very happy place usually, so this is the farm in people's mind's eye. Now this is important for us because these are the cultural resources that people use. If you're an animal advocate and you're talking to people about farm animals, for example, or animal use in a general sense, then this is the kind of picture they've got in mind. This is the kind of thing that we've got to kind of overcome because this is the kind of very kind of uh, relieving kind of picture that they rely on in a cultural sense. Another aspect is that these farms are full of homes and so there's no cages there, that's a very common feature. Uh, also, inevitably, we're talking about family units in these types of farms. And in fact, it's usually more than this, so you normally would get uh, pigs and piglets, and chickens and uh, chicks and uh, those kind of things. And of course, from a more kind of animal rights point of view, if you like, there's no suggestion of this, there's no suggestion of end use. So there's no slaughterhouse trucks, there's no mention of the fact that this is what's kind of going on uh, in this sense. So. Let's just try to kind of build a little bit on the sociology of that, just, just for a few minutes. I'm actually going to use some psycholinguistic uh, text for this from Stanley Sappho here. And he's looking at the social transmission of social values. The important part is this bit that's picked out at the bottom there, which is to, to be kind to one another, be kind to animals, to abhor cruelty of any sort. Violence is not the way that we resolve conflicts, and the taking of life 
is wrong. That, in general terms, is a kind of set of values that we suggest to children when they're fairly young. And what Sappen says is that we present our young with a kind of package, and he calls it a syllabus of general norms and values. And of course, what we do with norms and values is, is, there, is we kind of transmit them generationally. That's the kind of interesting part about that. And the important parts of this are the bits picked out in red, because essentially the story is that Sappen is arguing that eventually there comes a time when we have to clue our kids in to the reality of the world. We create a fantasy land at the beginning, and then we have to gradually let them in to the fact that something else is kind of happening. And he says that um, eventually our children understand that those values that we initially talk about are actually violated in society. And not only that, sometimes the violation of those values are actually celebrated sometimes. And so he says that we've eventually got to let our kids in to the idea that there's a two-tier value system. In fact, you could argue it's more complicated than just that, the two-tier idea. And so, as a general matter, he says that when you're talking about morality, and in particular what I call human-non-human -human relations, we as adults deceive ourselves. We deceive each other and we deceive our children. Essentially then, what we're talking about is a lot of core basic values that uh, go around society are kind of based on lies, really, that we kind of collectively share. And so this is going to be, I'm going to actually read out. It says that adults typically raise children from birth to five or six years in a kind of fantasy land of ideal behavior in the parts of the world's inhabitants. In this land of goodness and mercy, other animals are humanity's friends, and vice versa applies. And then when he looks at the publications, the kind of publications which will engender the kind of pictures that we saw before, he says, once again, there's no slaughter, there's no kill lines. And interestingly as well, in terms of, kind of a blatant kind of display, there's very, very little in terms of, of uh, other animals being eaten in these kind of uh, publications for children. So this is Sappen's research question, because he wants to know about the psych psychological consequences of when we get older and when we can <coughs> let in on more of the truth, if you like. So it's, it's useful for us. What he's saying, in a sense, that we need to recondition our children. At first it's all goodness and light, fantasy land, and then we slowly let them in. What that essentially means is, at this stage, we start to talk to our children about different categories. And so we start to differentiate between, say, pets and then food animals, maybe the ones we wear, we might even use a category like vermin, okay? So a whole society of, of, of animals is suddenly started to be chopped up, as it were, into these different boxes, and that's to do with the fact that we want to then claim that some of, some of them we can use in different ways. He also says that when we're dealing with the adult world, we're dealing with a world of delusions and denial. Now, one thing the literature is very strong on, there's absolutely loads of literature about this, going back to Freud, is that human beings are very good at denial. It's something that we're really kind of good at. So we're kind of good at fooling ourselves and, uh, and so forth. So we're moving then the other animals into a situation where we can claim them to be objects of utility. In other words, we then start talking about how we start to use them. And that's how we start to talk about these different ways of doing it. And again, another general point, this is from a psychoanalytical point of view, is that the idea that we lie to ourselves is actually fairly commonplace, and it's also functional. It's a very functional thing to do. But one thing that we know is that knowledge is said to represent power, but knowledge can also represent pain. There's an interesting concept which is there are other things to do with knowledge than know it. We can push it away, we can deny it, we can even make it kind of foggy and go away. Yeah? We're almost like into that political thing you might remember from a few years ago when they talked about you know, known unknowns and unknown knowns and this, this, this kind of idea. What Carol Adams says, and she's an eco-feminist, the author of Sexual Politics of Meat, she said this is what we do essentially when we're talking about our treatment of other animals. She's got a concept called the absent referent. And so we push the animal away, conceptually. 
So people go into a steak restaurant and they order a steak. They don't order a dead body. That's not the way that we want it seen. And in fact, the vegans in the audience will probably know that just their presence sometimes in a particular social setting is uncomfortable. One of the reasons for that is because you're bringing back the absent reference, which they have pushed away. Right? So the end of this story is that sociologically there are some things that we don't particularly want to know in great detail. We certainly don't want precise details. So then we can say, okay, well, what's better for us to know, especially in relation to our children? And then that means that we're back to the farms. It's better to know that this is what the reality of farming is, rather than the real reality, if you like. What we get here, this is a book that I looked at in my uh, research, and this is Tales from Mud Puddle Farm. And um, as you see here, there's a whole kind of society of, of other animals, there's a social consensus, there's a social contract at work, which is summed up here by this quote from the farmer, and he says, you look after me, and I'll look after you. How that, how that pans out in the story is that the hens lay eggs for the farmer. Now, there's two dairy cows on this farm. This is interesting, there's no calves. There's no mention of pregnancy. There's no mention of the, of the kind of mammalian thing about you need to be pregnant in order to give milk. Right? What happens in the story is that they let their milk down for him. You know? Which is an interesting phrase, as though they can biologically keep it up or something. But it's, it's, in a sense, it's the idea that this is the rent that they pay for being there in this kind of cosy uh, consensus. Now, so if that's the, the book that I looked at, there we go, I was quite surprised to find several years later that it came back again in a different format, which might surprise you, came back in the format of a McDonald's Happy Meal. And there's actually a YouTube video of the illustrator, I think he's sat in his car, and he's kind of going, look, you know, I drew these pictures and now they're, they're in a McDonald's Happy Meal, how cool is that type of thing? What there isn't in any of the video is kind of like, fucking hell, that's a bit weird, isn't it? You know, kind of, I've been, I've been drawing pictures of farmed animals, and inside this box, I'll cut up bits of farmed animals. And I think the, the clue to it, in cultural terms, is the phrase happy. Because this is the phrase that uh, struck me, which was, what better way to perpetuate the happy farm than with the idea of the happy meal? And so, of course, they were all skippy, hippy, happy animals in that box. There was no, there was a complete disconnect in terms of, of what he was talking about. Okay, so I'm going to bring this to a close pretty quick so we can get talking because that's what Pez wants us to do. Um, just, just go through a few other things that I looked at in the research. These um, initial ones have got a very simple narrative, you know, usually what, no what noise the cows make, this kind of thing. But very quickly, the narrative gets quite complicated. This one here, Nubbins and the Tractor, it's got a quite complicated narrative. It's about animal property. And it's about the transfer of animal property. In fact, if uh, legal scholar Gary Francione was here right now, he'd be jumping up and down saying, see, property, that's the interesting thing. Other animals are categorised as things. They're items of property. So the story goes, the, the farmer buys a tractor, and then the horse is redundant, and we're going to sell the horse. The son is not too happy about this. Then the tractor breaks down, and so the son says to the farmer, Dad, if you transfer the ownership of Nubbins to me, we'll work on the farm for you. Yeah? So the last scenes in the book is both of them are happy as Larry, getting back, you know, the horse can't wait to get back into, into, into the saddle, as it were, to be able to pull the, the plough, because you know, the ownership has been transferred. This one's quite interesting, Four Ways Farm. It was a DVD at the time, and I was, I was looking at it. Um, no, it's a, a, um, you know, a video tape, it's probably a DVD down. The interesting thing about that is it's an entire bunch of, of um, adventures with a complete um, population of other animals and there's no humans involved at all. When we get to teenagers, this is like a, a very kind of poppy kind of thing, it's called Animals and You. Very much focused at the teenage girl or young women audience and most of it is about pets. And there are some references to free living beings. Now, farm animals, they do appear in this kind of publication, but only as food. For example, there's a December um, edition where they're saying, well, what are we going to have for Christmas? They go, oh, it's going to have to be the turkey and all the trimmings. So then you've got the picture of 
you know, the young girl, as it were, with the pet enjoying the turkey. So if farmed animals appear in this, it's as food, in a different category, as, as in what I was saying before. And finally, market day is it like a board game, like Monopoly. And what you get there is all the people kind of running around. Uh, and their job, their farmers, is to collect other animals until their farm is full. And so as soon as your farm is full, you've won. Right? Now again, on an ideological level, I mean this is, it, culturally it makes sense, but on an ideological level, it doesn't ask any questions like, well why do farmers collect other animals in the first place? And what are they going to do with them? Not, not, all of that is kind of missing from this kind of, kind of narrative. And it's this kind of narrative, all of that, that we grow up with. And so, back to the question, and back to sociology, the answer, or at least to lift the lid on this, is that we're socialised to do this. We're socialised that some animals we should love, and some other animals are vermin, other animals are there for food, you know. Now, for the animal advocates, they often try and make a claim which they think is quite effective, which is, why do you pet one and eat the other? Now, unfortunately, sociologically, that is not as powerful as people think it is. The reason people do that is because some animals are designated as pets, and so you pet them. That's the type of animal use you put those animals to. The other animals are so-called food animals. That's the type of animal use that they are put through. So we can kind of explain the fact that the values that people have, if you're on the street talking to them about veganism or whatever, the values that they come at you with are all from their, children, their childhood, growing up with these values reinforced by the whole society that effectively lies to itself. Okay, so that's enough from me, and Pears wanted me to open up to Q&A, so shall we do it? Hi. Uh, I just had a question, like you were saying that uh, humans are very good at denial, Yes. and that um, we don't really think about what's on our plate, where it came from, or anything like that, and that that's, that's obviously a good reason for why uh, humans keep eating meat, and that kind of makes sense as well. But what about people who work in the meat industries, where we kind of see this every day? How do they justify? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good, good question. And, and another question, just to preempt any others, is that there is a difference. In the story I've just told, there's, there's an urban rural divide as well. In other words, some kids from farming backgrounds, for example, are not going to be as mystified about what really goes on in, in farms as well. Although, again, you know, in, a, in the foot and mouth uh, thing that happened in England, you had farmers crying because they actually saw the other animals that they bred being killed, which is not what they normally see, you know. Um, what was the first part of it again? Just that we're very good at denial and that we don't think about where our food has come from. Yeah. Um, but you know, people work in these industries, they can't be in denial. I mean, it yeah, well, there's a lot, there's a lot of thing about, a lot of the people who work in these industries are kind of trapped in a poverty situation. You know, mo and there's um, a big slaughterhouse in County Meath, and most of the people who work there are Brazilian. You know, and if you if you look at across the world, kind of slaughterhouse work and poverty goes hand in hand. Another thing that happens in slaughterhouses is that they have a really quick staff turnover because people can't quite manage to kind of live with this kind of thing. But you know, going back to the denial thing, we shouldn't underestimate denial. I mean, there is even cases in the research. There's no children here, is there? There's cases in research where mothers have held down their daughters to be abused and then denied it later, you know, so denial is a very strong thing in society, you know, we're good at it, you know. Hi. Um, so you said that there's a lot of petting that you're using the argument of why would you pet one animal and eat another isn't a good kind of story to tell a non-vegan, like what would be, what is a good way of getting through the world? Uh, what, apart from live vegan, I don't, uh, I don't know. The thing is, what I was really saying there is that uh, a lot of animal advocates think that's a real kind of clincher. Yeah. You know, kind of you, you know, if if you if you treat this animal like this, then what about the ones that you treat in a different way? And of course, for some people, they, they do go, oh, I never thought of it that way. But from a sociological point of view, particularly there's a discipline called functionalism. Then you answer it by saying, well, that is their function. So, you know, if you're looking at animal use, you know, so the difference between animal rights and welfare is that animal rights is about animal use, welfare is about animal treatment. But if you're looking at use, then we use some as pets, and we use others as food, you know? So, it's interesting in the sense that 
um, when I've seen that argument being made, and people go, well, well, these are food animals. What, 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 what? You know. Then they might say things like, uh, if we didn't eat them, they wouldn't exist. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, some, uh, there was um, somebody from the Alliance for Animal Rights on the radio the other day, and the presenter said, uh, well, if we didn't eat fishes, the sea would be, become overflow, flowing with, with fishes. And she said, are you serious? <laughs> but people say that all the time. You know, we're going to be, you know, it's as, it's as though we're just out there, as it were, gathering up the free living beings and eating them. That's not the way it goes. We purposely breed them. You know, there's a massive artificial insemination plant in Enfield, in, uh, in uh, County Meath. You know, and artificial insemination is a big thing now in Ireland. I know there is a lot of mythology about, you know, what's the reality of Irish farms. And there probably will be in some rural areas some genuine free-range farms. But there's a move towards industrialisation now. So it's moved away from that big style. And as I said, artificial insemination is a uh, big one. Did anybody know what artificial insemination is? Yeah, okay. The one, one interesting thing about that which people don't know is they, they use bulls called teaser bulls. So they chain one bull to a wall, and then they get the second bull to mount the first bull. Then they rush in there, I mean, kind of like, Daddy, what did you do all day? They rush in there with, with an artificial vagina to, to get the semen, and then they rush off to the freezer. Now, the reason they use the first bull is because these bulls are so massive now through artificial uh, through genetic engineering, that they can't use cows because if, if a bull mounted a cow, it would break her limbs, her hips. So they have to use another bull. They're called teaser bulls. You know? In fact, there, there is, um, if you look on YouTube, there is something from ear to the ground. It's really interesting. It's about 12 minutes about artificial insemination in County Meath. And it's interesting because the, the presenter and uh, the people doing the artificial insemination, they're just making jokes. You know, as though, as though it's a really kind of funny thing, like going, oh, you know, this ball is ready to pop and this kind of stuff. And, oh, that was a good jump and all this kind of stuff. They were really making kind of juvenile jokes, you know, which is one, one way that they could deny what they're doing as well, because they were making it something else, a bit of a laugh, you know. Hey. Um, it's not quite a question, but I just think this is kind of like crazy. I'm 18, and um, I went vegan like three weeks ago because I watched a ton of documentaries, like from a media there, and watched a ton of documentaries and just was like, wow. I never knew that cows had to be pregnant to give milk. Yeah. I grew up thinking that cows had to be milked, that cows just produced this milk give all the life. time. That's years old, right? It's crazy. Who, who, else, who else believed that in the room? Oh, yeah. yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. That's right. But the, the, point, the point is, we the, actually, there's an interesting story about that because we tend to deny that we're animals, right? Yeah. Now, if you call somebody else an animal, you're usually insulting them, aren't you? Like, you know, if somebody says, you're an animal, you are, you don't say, yeah, I know that, you know? Or if, if, you say, if somebody says, you're just an ape, you go, yeah, I know that. People don't, people don't do that. So we don't self-identify as an ape, or an animal, usually. We don't self-identify as a mammal. And people, and this is a mystery, really, you know, from the feminist point of view, you know, like, women don't seem to make that connection as well, because they will know that if they wanted to lactate, they would need to be pregnant, although there are obviously things like wet nurses, which is a complicated factor. But generally speaking, if you want to give the volume of milk that's needed for a baby, you would have to be pregnant. They don't transfer that reality of being a mammal to cows. We're in denial. That's what it is. Hi. I thought it was interesting when um, you were talking about the denial part earlier. Um, Everyone likes denial yeah. today. Yeah. <laughs> I was curious in that because like, I find that uh, because of that denial, um, it tends to, and I'm vegan, so it tends to um, bring out aggression and, and violent reactions in people just by, without being confrontation or anything like that. So I was wondering what, uh, you know, what your suggestion was for relationships with people who don't, um, like friends, family, etc., not just um, partners. Yeah, well, how, like, do you suggest just a ban like a ban Some people would say, oh, I, I don't want to deal with that because it's just violence mm. and uh, well, there arguments. Are, yeah, there are some people who are just not open to the message or, if you like, open to be educated, if you like. Another thing, again, sociologically, you mentioned families. A lot of animal advocates, you can see this on Facebook a lot, you know, kind of like, I just can't get through to my family. One thing to understand is that your family might be the hardest audience for you to talk to. 
because you're, you've got all your family garbage and baggage as well. Kind of, you know, I'm not going to have my whippersnapper brothers telling me that kind of thing. If a stranger said it, it might be different. So if you are in that situation where the, the people who are least seem to be open to what you want to say or what you want to do or your feelings about things, they are the, your members of your family. Well, it can be explained that way. So don't, don't lose heart because they might be the hardest ones to talk to, not the easiest. Whereas, you know, obviously, it's kind of counterintuitive. You think, well, I must surely be able to get through to the people I live with all the time, but it's not the case. You know? well, I find it you know, isolates you from people. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, that's what I struggle to get around, you know. People who are close to you. That's how you uh, conceptualize your relationship with others. Yeah. Because you're the one that's No, no, but we're just my presence, you know, just the. If, if someone watches you, what you're eating, I mean, that's making a statement for itself, you know, if you're sharing a house with someone. Yeah. Well, I, I think another... Yeah. I, I think I think an, I think another thing which is good point. I mean, this, this, this point is, is really kind of close, close to my heart because, you know, it's, I, I believe that the vegan movement has lost its heart. And if you look at the founders of the vegan community uh, com uh, movement, we're talking about 1944, these people were doing something that which we would now call intersection in nature. They saw themselves as part of the peace movement. They saw themselves as part of the moral evolution of humanity. Donald Watson, one of the co-founders of the Vegan Society, said that veganism was the greatest cause of all. And he thought then it would be an overarching philosophy. And this is what we've lost, because time and time again now, People talk about veganism as though it's a bloody diet. It's not. It's a philosophy. It's a justice for all philosophy. When we do the stalls in Dublin streets, we've got signs saying, Vegan Information Day, justice for all. And we've got pamphlets about feminism. We've got pa pamphlets about all kinds of things, anti-racism, anarchy even. Stuff that is connected as a justice thing. And people come up and say, well, what's this got to do with it? And we say, well, it's got to do with it because we're all justice activists. You know, animal rights and veganism is about justice. It's not about diet. You know, the people who want to tell you it's a diet have usually got something to sell, or they want you to be members of the vegan society or something. You know, the people who tell you it's a philosophy are giving you a grander vision. Now, some people dismiss that as utopian, and you know, I've said on the radio that there is a utopian element, I suppose, to veganism. But the idea, if we had a vegan world, we would have a much less violent world, there'd be much more peace, people would get on, it's anti-war, it's anti-discrimination, it's for democracy, and it's just for justice. You know, some people argue, well, can you have all that <coughs> along with capitalism? So we get into difficult areas then, and it's probably true that, you know, the mode of production we call capitalism is probably not conducive to a vegan world. Because capitalism is about, you know, sociologists call it dog eat dog, not a very big phrase. But, um, you know, it's about making profit on the backs of others. That's what capitalism is all about, you know? I mean, obviously, capitalism is, is more flexible than what Marx thought it was, you know, because he thought it had its seeds of its own destruction in there. It ended up being much more subtle than that. But even so, whether it's conducive to the kind of world that we want as vegans is very uh, dodgy idea. Just to, you know, talk about the isolation and saying I have a very, very much felt that times, family and friends have known for years, and I do think that generally that moving, I don't know, spending more time with vegans makes it easier when you go back to those relationships, you know, and people understand like, where you're coming from, and, and probably, I mean, personally, I just, you know, it's, I find it harder to spend time with people who know, have no interest in, in this thing because it becomes almost to me like, you know, it's discrimination. That, you know, they don't want to hear about it. I may as well be sitting with someone who's sexist or racist. Just so, keep the idea alive, basically. Well, I would start with some people. I would start, like, some of my friends will come with me, you know, unless it's in this direction, and others who haven't. So, who's to say that but some people you don't see for a while might go be eventually, you know, because it's, it is how it can happen. Yeah, there are other situations which are similar to our, our situation. Like, for example, I, mean, I should teach the sociology of humour. And uh, you do then have a kind of management problem. If somebody starts telling racist or sexist jokes, what do you do? Yeah. You know, do you stop being their friend or do you carry on trying to educate them? It's a very similar kind of thing. Yeah. Really, 
And if they don't want to hear or they don't want to be entertained, what to do then? That's right. You know, and you know, uh, you know, sometimes if they don't want to take the piss, they'll just ramp up their sexism and, and racism and stuff. And, and that's where you then have to make a decision. These people are not my friends after all because our values are just too divergent, you know? And then also you can spend like most of your life just complaining to people or like, yeah, trying to be trying to point out things or trying to nitpick or criticize. Yeah, the good, you don't want to be doing either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One, one, one rule of thumb is that if there's somebody who's really, is really blocked to what you want to say, move on to somebody else. Because the thing is, social change doesn't mean that we've got to convince everyone, or even 51% that have democratic sense. Yeah. What you need in terms of social change is that if there is a population, a, a group of a population, but the numbers are unknown, some people say 10%, other people say 20%, 25%, who have got a kind of unshakable belief, they can bring about change. That goes back to what I said at the beginning. Most people in society are conformists. If most vegetarian, uh, if most um, restaurants in Dublin were vegan, everybody, everybody just go to those restaurants and they'd be fine and happy about it, you know. Because and they bring up their kids like that, it wouldn't be a problem because they conform <coughs> to norms and values. Most people conform to norms and values, which is why in the, in the apartheid time. You know, I used to know this guy, he came up from, from uh, South Africa, I was working as a projectionist in England at the time. He was totally racist, he used to call black people kaffirs, which is their version of the, the N-word, right? But it was just, that's the way he was brought up, you know? So, you know, being in the type of society that we want is important, and the, the more vegans we can get, the better, on two levels. That level, the cultural change, and also, it's undoubtedly true that by eating vegan, that phrase I don't particularly like, you do cause harm. For example, there are ways of harvesting which cause harm, or the way of farming that which cause harm. The only solution to the harm that vegans do is for them to be more ethical vegans in society, which means then that we get the socio and political power to make some structural change. There are some changes we can't make as individuals. If you, you can look at um, videos on YouTube and look at the prairies, the way, the way that uh, grain is harvested. You've got a whole bank of combine harvesters. The other animals have got no chance, the ones in front, in front of them. But if we demanded change as the consumers, powerful consumers, we could change that. We could fit the machinery with, with, with uh, ultrasound, which would warn the other animals that, that there's something coming, and they would, they would move away. We could all kinds of things. We, we could move into a kind of no-dig. I used to run a no-dig allotment, you know. There are no-dig ways of, um, of producing, you know. We could make change. But we need to have a lot more of us. We need to change the culture. If we change the culture, that would change the political situation. It tends to be that way rather than the other way, because politicians are followers and not leaders. They think they're leaders, but they're not. They follow money, they follow votes. We all know that. Right? So if we've got the money, we've got the votes, they'll follow us. But we need to change the culture first. Our job is to be critical of the ideology of speciesism and to change the culture on that. That's what the vegan job is. Any more for any more? Sorry, Roger. Just, um, just reaching back for a moment to what uh, Virgil and Liz, you guys were talking about the isolation piece yeah. of the feeling of the frustration. Just, I don't know how many new vegans we have. I know you guys have been vegan for a while, but I know that there's a few of us who have only recently gone vegan. It's just that if you feel that your immediate surroundings are kind of getting to you and you, you've you realized that you've you've made that decision to go vegan and you've made that decision to change your life for the better and try to cause less harm to non-human animals and you're frustrated that your your nearest and dearest don't understand that like maybe it's your best friend, your significant other, your mom, your dad, whoever, you know, just to kind of make sure that, that you you educate yourself on ways to, um, ways to, you know, take a moment for yourself and care for yourself. Um, if you're interested, Sandra Brandt of the Eden Animal Sanctuary, she's a psychologist. Sandra Higgins. Sandra, Sandra Higgins, sorry, Sandra Higgins, yes. Sandra Higgins, she's done a, she's done a lot of work around this, so if you want to just um, Google her name and Google her, um, her work, she's done a lot of kind of self-care for activists type of things. So don't let it get to you, um, and don't let, don't let that, the fact that other people aren't really listening to you, don't let that... Weaken your resolve, you know. You don't forget you're a revolutionary, one of the most important people around. You see, the vegan movement has kind of lost its heart a little. Do you feel that there's momentum building though? You look at how many people are here today, for instance. Like I'm, I've only been vegan two years. I, I don't know that much about it, but uh, 
I would think that yeah, in it's, the 50s or even the 70s. There was I, I, I was talking about the kind of general discourse. There is, <coughs> there is some recent research which suggests that, um, in fact, they conflate quite often the research. Research on the vegan movement is very bad because they, often they, they conflate, conflate veganism and vegetarianism, which is problematic in the first place. You know, vegetarianism is a diet, veganism is a philosophy. But the research is suggesting that 80, up to 80 percent of people who go vegetarian stroke vegan go back to eating flesh again. The research suggests that the ones who don't do that are ethical vegans. Now, ethical vegans is a problematic, controversial phrase because ethical vegans just means vegan. Every, everybody who's vegan is an ethical vegan. It's just that there are other categories now that people talk about, you know. And then you've got other, other parts of the movement who want to kind of like make things easier than it is to bring the masses in. And so somebody wanted to propose the idea of lacto-vegan. Um, so, so somebody came up with the idea that it was okay for a vegan to eat venison if you're kind of walking through a wood and a, and a deer happens to drop dead in front of you, then, you know? And in certain circumstances, you know, um, honey, honey has always been a problem, you know? And this idea of backyard hens, that, that's always been an issue. So there are there is a lot of push going the other way as well. It's called uh, reducitarianism. Yeah. You'd wonder whose payrolls they're on the Exactly, yeah. yeah. You would, yeah. yeah. I think that well well, well said. I'm glad you said that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is a good one to talk about actually the backyard things because I've I've met quite a number of vegans who actually don't have much of a problem with that. They might not deal with it themselves, but they know people who say well it's okay. You know, because yeah. they're giving them a nice life or whatever. Yeah, well, I mean, my answer to it, because I'm a rights-based, again, a problematic phrase. We talk about ethical vegan being a problematic phrase. I describe myself as a rights-based animal rights advocate. Now, the reason I have to say this long-winded uh, thing is that most people in the animal rights movement do not adhere to the philosophy of animal rights. Most people, and most of the big groups, if you talk about Anna Maid, Peter, any, any, anyone that you might know, they tend to follow the philosophy of Peter Singer. Now, Peter Singer doesn't believe in rights, not even human rights. He says that rights is not a good basis for a ethical position. He's a utilitarian. And, you know, the, the classic utilitarians call moral rights nonsense on stilts, you know? So animal rights is based on moral rights, you know? And so what I would say, the, the animal rights position on that would be that who produced the eggs? Whose property are the eggs? they belong to the chickens. And Sandra Higgins would say that in the natural situation, the original guinea, guinea fowl, they would produce a clutch of, of uh, eggs about twice a year, maybe three times, I think. Whereas now, we, we've genetically engineered them to produce every other day or every day. It puts a vast strain on them. You know, One way that you can replenish their system is let them eat their own unfertilized eggs, which they will do. You know, so that's the answer. I mean, they're there. You know, I always say, well, look, you know, if they tie one up in a ribbon, roll it into your door, and knock on, on the door, and say, gift, <laughs> then that might be okay morally. But until they do that, I say, leave, leave the edge of the hens, that's what I say. <laughs> any more for any more? Well, end with that time. Three more minutes? Three or Oh, okay, we've got, we've got about two minutes then, before we get kicked out. We're supposed to finish about three. What about that? Um, something that you, that you said earlier, which sort of brought up this, this whole sort of inner conflict that I have. There are so many people who think that it's cool to be vegan now. It's sort of, you know, the diet, I mean, you mentioned the diet for a lot of people instead of ethical yeah. more of what's based on which I believe it is. Yeah. And so for me, when people say they are vegan, but, oh yeah, I sometimes have I sometimes I have eggs, but um, you know, I'm, I am vegan and I really love animals. For me, that's very annoying because I don't believe that they truly are vegans. But I am within myself conflicted because should I, you know, encourage them because they are still doing something, yeah. or should I stand my ground and say, well, actually, no, you're not a vegan, and yeah, it's you know, very what, difficult. you're reasoning behind yeah. this. From a, from a movement point of view, you've hit on something which is very difficult and long-standing too. I, I, I actually don't mind the phrase vegan-ish. I think that kind of e explains what they are. You know, they're kind of going that way or they're staying at vegan-ish. I don't mind vegan-ish. A lot of vegans don't like vegan-ish. I don't 
mind that because if you're vegan it means you're not vegan. So it's kind of suggesting that there is something different about the two things which, which is true. You know? uh, so I, I kind of deal with that way. Um, another good way of thinking about it is the fact that it used to be traditionally in the, in the movement, I mean I've been a vegan since 1979, right? So in the 1980s, we used to say things like, um, go vegetarian first, you know? And then I know loads of people who got stuck in vegetarianism, particularly about uh, cheese, you know, because of the caseal morphine, the type of morphine that makes you addicted to it, you know? And so what we say now in the, in the modern movement, we say be as vegan as possible, yeah? Because everybody expects people to make incremental steps and to reach just the dietary aspects on their own. What I tend to think is that if we ramp up the truth that veganism is a philosophy, it would help the person that you're talking about to be not veganish and vegan. Because when people have got an ethical reason, it kind of firms up their view. And that's what the research is saying. If you've got an ethical re reason to do something, then you're not as tempted by things, you know? I mean, you know, as a vegan since 1979, it's difficult for me to think that anybody is not tempted by all the brilliant, you know, vegan foods about. I mean, there wasn't any soy milk when I, when, when I went vegan, you know, this kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, I just, you know, I just think that, well, you know, if we, if we encourage people to understand the origins of veganism, which is a justice for all movement, which cared for everybody, and was part of the peace movement, stands for non-violence, I mean, they started the vegan society, at the time of war, 1944. Now, they've all got this kind of image of being little pottery kind of gardeners and everything. They were really radical people. They were conscience objectors at the time of war. They started veganism, and the interesting thing as well, 21st century vegans probably don't realize that the initial vegan pioneers were told by everybody they were gonna die. Literally, they were gonna die if they didn't eat animal products, because that was the thing. All the doctors said they were gonna die. You know, so they had a. Oh, I mean, they, I always kind of quipped that they, they said, okay, well, I'll, I'll risk it for a vegan biscuit kind of thing, and th that's kind of what they did. You know, and so some of the early pioneers, like Watson, they had to speak for a long time about health. They had to prove that it was possible. We don't have that problem anymore. In fact, we know it. You know, in terms of health, it's great. You know, I mean, there's health benefits that you know we, we didn't even dream about, and you know, here they are. But that still doesn't um, change the fact that, at heart, we're talking about an ethical position about our relations with other sentient beings, you know, and with each other, and with the planet itself. Veganism has got a lot of answers, says a lot of things like that, says a lot of things about feminism, anti-racism, discrimination, hierarchy, says a lot of things about that. If we talk more about that, I think people that you're dealing with might kind of go, oh, well, I know, there's a bit more to it than I thought. You know? Um, I think we might have to go on, I think. <laughs>